Right. So we have two, um, well, first of all, let me introduce myself. So my name is Richard Dunks, Director of Research and Strategy at IOI. I'm really excited to be leading this session. So um, our goal in this second half is to really dig into um, what, what, the great things we just heard from Pia uh, around Exit to Community, the Open Collective, and the work that they're trying to do. Um, we heard some things about um, kind of the serendipity of some of the things that they, you know, the situation circumstances they found them in and what they were able to do. Um, and so we want to talk about that. And we have two really wonderful people to join us who are um, kind of looking at this from different perspectives, but with the same kind of intention of how do we build up this space? How do we make this really work well? So we have Joy Owongo and um, Elizabeth Searing. And I would ask them to first introduce themselves, give us a little bit of their background, how they come to the nonprofit space. And I'll ask uh, Joy, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off and then have Elizabeth introduce. Thank you so much. So um, I'm Joy Owango, the Executive Director of the Training Center in Communication. It's a research capacity trust uh, housed at the university and also in partnership with the University of Nairobi, Kenya. And what we do is uh, we support researchers, research institutes and governments on how they can improve their research output and increase their visibility through scholarly and science communication capacity building. And hot on the heels on scholarly communication falls open, open science, uh, education and awareness and open science and open access and how it can help them improve their outputs and also increase their visibility. So how we got into, and I also sit on the board and we are the founding project partner for Africa Archive, that is Africa's only preprint uh, platform. And how we got into the not-for-profit space was interestingly enough when we, uh, we were invited by the University of Nairobi to set up uh, a project, a biosafety and biotechnology project. And we noticed that the researchers could not even communicate amongst themselves doing the same project, but the biosafety researchers could not talk to the biotechnology researchers. So it was quick, we're quick to note that they need to know, need to know to communicate amongst themselves and know how to write beta, better papers. And that is academic papers. And we realized if we are quick to point fingers at the researchers and not look at the system within the university that is supporting them. And we realized that universities did not have the capacity to support uh, researchers in scholarly communication unless they were, even by then there was no definition of scholarly communication, it was scientific writing, unless they were in funded projects or in the research interest areas of the, of the country. So in this case, you're looking at health sciences and agricultural sciences. So you'd see a dichotomy amongst researchers within the same university, they can't communicate amongst themselves. And there's one group of researchers who know how to write and others who do not know how to write, who understand the uh, publishing process and others do not. So because of that, uh, we, we reached out to the University of Nairobi and we said that we needed to set up a center or a trust that could support researchers in improving their research output, particularly when it came to scholarly communication. Now what we call scholarly communication. And why we chose the not-for-profit route, so basically a trust, is that you're in the higher education sector and we were, and that was 15 years ago when we were set up. And by the time you're coming to any higher education stakeholder as a for-profit organization, you are approached with trepidation. And we needed to be accessible to our community, our community now being the academic, uh, the higher education stakeholders at various stratas, whether it's at ministerial level, whether it's at institutional level, or even when it, whether it's at researcher level. So that's what triggered us to choose that option. And then fortunately for us during that same period, the Kenyan government uh, enacted the Private Public Partnership Act. So we came in as a private sector, who is a not-for-profit, who wants to work with government institutions and uh, higher education sector. And that really helped us. So we literally ride on the Private Publish Public Partnership Act. And uh, because we chose to be a not-for-profit organization, 15 years later, we've supported over 11,500 researchers. And we're talking about masters and PhD level in their research life cycle. We've worked with over 80, institutions and we've worked in over 40 African countries supporting them in improving their research visibility and output. So working at various levels with stakeholders. So that's how we got ourselves into the not-for-profit uh, arena. But at the same time, we had to be smart because 
when you're setting up a not-for-profit and you're in Africa, we don't want to be to fall under the the the, the challenge that comes with dependency theory, so that you are 100% reliant on funding. So we had to look at smart systems that would make us sustainable. So we used a business model, but we made sure that everything was not for profit. So business model in the sense that we would uh, pitch for business, would create commercial partnerships, but then the fact that we were registered as not for profit, everything was reinvested back into the organization for growth. So this has been very useful because it made us think outside the box on how you can create potential partnerships. Uh, and when you're looking at partnerships, it could be infrastructural support or financial support or uh, the kind of support that can help you uh, be sustainable within your project. And that explains why we've been in existence for 15 years. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a way I, I always insist that not-for-profit organizations should consider looking at other than the 100% reliance on funding. Because if we look at the Global South right now, and anyone who's come from the UK, you can confirm that the UK government has literally slashed all funding and they did that in July last year. So there is no funding coming from the UK for all the major projects. So you're back to scratch. So you, you cannot find it, you, you should not, you cannot, and funding is getting limited. So you, you find yourself competing for the same pot of money instead of thinking of innovative ways to be sustainable and at the same time serve your targeted communities. So that's how I got into, into, into being a not-for-profit and supporting the higher education sector. Thank you so much. My story will sound so much less interesting and compelling following Joy. I should have asked to go first. Um, my name is uh, Elizabeth Searing. I'm an assistant professor of public and nonprofit management at the University of Texas um, at Dallas. Um, I'm currently based in the United States. My areas of specialty are in nonprofit financial management um, and in what I call comparative social economy. Um, very few people in the US use the term social economy, um, but I think it's a, a good description of what it is that I do. Um, most of my background has been actually as a uh, behavioral economist and uh, capacity builder for startups. Um, I'm simply what I call sector agnostic in relation to what corporate form those organizations might take. Um, uh, whether or not you're a nonprofit, a low profit, a for profit, a cooperative, um, will depend partially on what you anticipate your revenue streams being, um, in addition to what it is that you produce or you do, uh, in addition to what your anticipated governance model looks like. Um, and so I think that focus should be more on the task at hand um, and then thinking about what the corporate form should be to get it done. Um, and of course, that will vary a lot um, from country to country. Um, and so I've been very fortunate to be a part of several international efforts, such as uh, IXEM, which um, was headquartered out of Belgium, um, where we tried to, I was part of a team that attempted to map all types of social enterprise around the globe. Um, and that was quite interesting. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to be here with you today um, to, to tackle some of the logistical questions um, around trying to fund uh, uh, initiatives like this, especially ones that branch across uh, numerous types of uh, legislative, regulatory, um, and, and cultural domains. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and just to kind of put the context for this, so what we're intention is is to kind of build off of, or what was build off what Pia said, and we, as you can tell from the those wonderful introductions, uh, we have two very knowledgeable people who really worked with this, not only in a very, in an organization, single organization, but across organizations, across sectors. So we're hoping to get a broad view, but I'm curious for both of you um, to, to unpack this for us. Like, is there something intrinsic to nonprofits that helps them be more community engaged? Tia mentioned particularly, you know, be able to put community at the center. Like, what is it about the nonprofit model and, and knowing that there are various different flavors and types of all of that um, that can dispose it to be more community engaged and community focused, do you think? But the, by the time 
a not-for-profit organization is created, they've identified a problem within their targeted community. So most nonprofits tend to be created around or around the community. So that's what I've been giving like TCC Africa as an example. We literally were, cre we were created around the challenge you are seeing within the academic community of, of the project that we were working on. So most nonprofits as that stand at least on our side of the world are created based on the challenges that are centered around that community. So the, I think it, the question should be like, as other than that, but what does it mean for the community? Does it, does it mean that the, how does the not-for-profit organization engage, effectively engage the community to meet their needs? So in such a situation, um, when a not-for-profit organization is created and, it, and its focus is community-based, the question is how do you engage them? How do you make them part of the process? Okay. And uh, how do you do that without uh, 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 an entitled bias because you see there's already an existing problem and if you want to engage your community you need to take a step back and be part of the problem be understand the problem from their side instead of coming with just a solution that this is how you're supposed to to solve the problem so that means that you have to be, your, your kind of engagement needs to be very conscious of the, the existing uh, challenges that this, uh, your community has. So I'll give an example of what we learned. When we, were, when we noted that the universities were having, researchers within universities were having problems with scholarly communication, it would have been a bit uh, uncalled for for us to say that we need to teach you on how to improve your scholarly communication instead what we did was that, because you see, the university's work is to do that, but you already saw the problem, okay? So for us to engage the community, in this case, the university effectively, was tell them, how can we work together to support your early career researchers? So you need to be smart about how you engage your, your community without having the, the bias of, 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 uh, of, of, trying to solve the problem without assuming that they're not cognizant of it or they are they are not cognizant of the existing problem or without being aware of the challenges that do not help that that lead with not, without being aware of the challenges that lead to them not being effective in some of the the issues that have been arisen that that have arisen yeah so in this case like in the case of the university why they're not able to support early career researchers was that there were administrative dynamics within the institution. So, you know, the staff are not paid well, they're overworked. So, you know, you, you just lump it under administrative dynamics. So with all that, you then you'll come to understand why most funded projects tend to have more research output as compared to, to non-funded projects. So be, be part of the process, don't, be, don't patronize them with the problem, be part of the process and support them and do it together with them. So that's how you end up engaging the community if once you've created the organization uh, with the community at the center, yeah. And I think that um, to, to kind of springboard off of, of what Joy said before, before I address the question directly about what about the nonprofit corporate form or tax exempt status, because that's really all nonprofit is. Nonprofits just saying, you're not paying taxes. So it's a tax exempt status. There's nothing really magical about what, what it is that, that they do. There are institutional elements that we'll talk about in a second. But, but first I wanted to, to agree with Joy in saying that it, it isn't, um, they don't equate each other. You can have a nonprofit that is totally neo-colonial, disengaged from the, the, you know, the, from the community. It's just because you've got your tax exempt status does not mean that you are a community oriented organization. I think especially in the US context and to, to be clear about this, I'll draw a lot on the US context, the Canadian context and the Italian context just because that's where I do a lot of my, my work. Um, especially in the US context, some of our largest hospital systems um, and health insurance agencies are nonprofits. Um, and it's 
highly debatable whether or not there is any element of community protection um, in those in those nonprofit organizations. So, so there is nonprofit doesn't equal community oriented necessarily. Um, but that said, there are things about the nonprofit, you know, corporate form that that makes it easier to try and protect community interests, provided that they were there in in the first place and are a priority. Um, on the financial side, the asset lock. Um, so many countries have uh, the asset lock where if the, if the nonprofit owns something, then even if the nonprofit disappears, it has to stay in the nonprofit sector. So I'm actually kind of intrigued by the organization goes away and then, you know, the assets are distributed to the community. We're, we're talking about like literally handing out cash door to door. That's, that's actually potentially not allowed. Um, but, but depending on, on the corporate structure, at least you know it's going to stay in the nonprofit community. Um, a second, there, there are going to be more likely governance structures that help keep things grounded in community if you're a nonprofit versus other forms. I would say not, not so much more than cooperatives, but it will depend a lot on the context. Um, so who holds the power to decide what the organization does and how the organization spends its money and achieves its mission um, is extremely important. Um, and at nonprofits, the board tends to be a lot more active in terms of governing the organization, um, but you know, cooperatives as well. Um, and, and the same thing with transparency. The regulatory burden on nonprofit organizations tends to be heavier in that you need to, you know, on in the U.S. and in Canada, you need to have your annual uh, uh, financial forms out there, same in the U.K. So at least there's this level of transparency. And I think that's what um, Open Collective is trying to engage in um, by, by having an even heightened level of financial transparency available for more informal groups um, to, to kind of build that, that credibility. But I I do think that it's it's interesting that um, that it sounds like in, in the open collective, it's what I would call a hybrid structure where you have the for-profit side that is bringing in the capital and then that for-profit side donates the money to the nonprofit side and the nonprofit side will um, help the, the membership organizations. It's a more complex structure, um, but it's trying to combine the best of both worlds where you've got the, the for-profit side that attracts investors You've got the nonprofit side that has the additional transparency and can entice those kinds of donations through, uh, through tax exemption. Um, and then it all kind of works together. So, so I think it's a, very, it's a very interesting model that's trying to combine the best of the nonprofit side with the um, features of the for-profit side. Thank you for that. And just a really quick, Bill, I'm curious, Joy, if you have any thoughts on that. And particularly, you mentioned with the uh, NGO Act in Kenya, you had kind of a menu of options of what you could go with. So this idea that Elizabeth is talking about, like this, you know, matching the structure and gives some kind of support besides just being a tax shelter, it's mm -hmm. it's enabling certain things. Can you talk a little bit more about that, like building up yeah. what Elizabeth to share on structure? So, so um, in Kenya, we have the NGO Act. And in the NGO Act, it has it has various structures of different types of non-for-profit organizations. So we have the trusts like TCC Africa. Then we have now the just the non-government organization. And then we have the community-based organizations. And each of them have have uh, they they have various um, mandates that have been assigned to them, even the kind of duties that they have to do within those mandates. So like in the case of a community-based organization, the community-based uh, community organization is a grassroots organization. So it is a not-for-profit organization, but at a grassroots level. So even when international uh, 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 international uh, NGOs come, they know what level they want to interact with their various communities. They will know, they will, they will know which kind of organization they'll, they'll end up working with at a not-for-profit level. And especially the CBOs come in, in the, if it's particularly in the social sciences and the public health uh, research uh, areas. So they want to have access to the community. So that's where you find um, organizations like international organizations like 
Oxford tend to work, not Oxford, uh, um, yes, Oxford, they tend to work with uh, CBOs and in, um, in, 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 uh, in Kenya. So whether it's in the health sector or whether it's in the WASH program. So these are really on the ground. And then when you have the trusts like us, our mandates are very clear on the kind of level we need to, to work with. Even the, even the definition of community at that level is defined. So that is why for us, it's, it's at an institutional level, it's at a government level, even with the researchers, it's at a certain level even amongst the researchers. So the reason why this came up um, for those who are not from Kenya is that uh, we had quite a number of non-governmental organizations and because of terrorism, they found that money was being funneled through non-government organizations. So in order to identify, it, and you see, uh, back to what Elizabeth was saying, funding wasn't transparent. So money was just coming in through the non-government organizations. So in order to, to, to support organizations that was, that to, 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 to work with organizations that were working with various communities and they had amazing initiatives, they had to create structures of these uh, not-for-profit organizations and create mandates on what level they need to work they needed to work at. So the most the strictest level amongst the non-government organizations uh, in the in the in the NGO Act is the trust because it needs to be each organization needs to have a signature from the trust deed needs to be signed by the Minister of Lands and that the, the minister himself, so not his representative, but by the minister, and it has to go through the attorney general's office. So it, it, you, it, it's quite a rigorous process in order to create a trust in Kenya, but then it also protects the government at, at the end of the day. Um, uh, is there any other question? Because I was going to answer the good and the bad. Yes. Oh, I'm actually yes, going, to, I'm going to tee that up, but I think Elizabeth has something to say, and then we'll go to that question. So thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. Just, I, I want to um, to kind of, I know that when we start talking about legal forms or when we talk, start talking about finance, uh, I know a lot of people will just kind of go, oh, you know, it's the legal forms kind of, you know, that's, that's details, you know, let the lawyers figure that out or let the accounts figure it out. Um, and so I just want to, to kind of toss out there that, you know, some people think that it was natural for me to go into finance because my background is in economics. Um, so of course I'd be working on with the numbers, but it's actually surprising um, because I was a behavioralist. Um, the reason that I look at the numbers and the corporate forms and things like that is because they actually represent different cultural beliefs and institutional factors that are at play in the different contexts in which we live. Um, so uh, comparing like the U.S. and uh, and and Italy, um, you know, the Italy you know has that had a thriving cooperative sector, um, um, and then still introduced the social cooperative corporate form because they felt that there were uh, missions that that needed to be accomplished that needed that were entirely separate from from the notion of being a cooperative. Now in the U.S. We allow our charities to do so many things that we actually have a very, very anemic and small cooperative sector. And so the reason that that is, um, and this is an oversimplification, but it's because in the US, anything that is not self um, and is you know, outside of self is social. So social economy stuff. Um, and that includes community. So if I was going to put together an organization that's designed to make my neighborhood more beautiful, um, participating in the activities of that organization in the US is not self, and so it is charitable. Whereas in the Italian context, um, the fact that it is a part of the community in which I live means that it is not entirely you know, social economy. It belongs in a cooperative because it is an outside of me task that is still taking place in a community in which I am a part. So it is not entirely unself-interested. So it's, it, there's a fundamental difference on what social economy means, on what being a part of a community means between the cultures that produced the laws in the US and the cultures that produced the laws in Italy. And so whenever, you know, whenever we start talking about, about laws and finance and stuff like that, I would, I would encourage you to always think about what caused those things to come about because it's actually those mm. things 
that you're going to be working with when mm-hmm. trying to bring in cross-cultural ideas and initiatives such mm-hmm. as building open data infrastructure. Because we, even if, if because I'm, I'm betting that even the word open um, will mean different things to different people depending on the different contexts that they're in. Um, and that's something that you're going to feel whenever you ask the logistical questions like the money and the, the legal and all that stuff. Never forget that it's the people at the core of this. And that's where um, the, the, the negotiation and the problems and the difficulties, I think, really lie. Not so much with the money. Yeah, and that, I think that's really important because I, what I hear you saying is really like broadening the context of our understanding. You know, and I think both of you are saying this, right? Like there's these different structures, different approaches, there's different ways to understand how these can be organized. And building off of what, what both of you said around, you know, Joy, you, you specifically said, you know, entitled bias and what that can do. Um, and Elizabeth, you mentioned that, you know, just because you're a nonprofit, you can be bad and be doing bad things. You know, this, it's not necessarily a virtue signal just to be uh, a nonprofit. So help us think through this. How, knowing we can't change laws, we can't shut down, do all this kind of stuff. How can we encourage the good? In other words, if you're going to be in this space and doing this, how do we encourage the good and then find ways to discourage the bad? Okay. Um, it's not even an issue of encouraging the good. It is the rise of the good and doing away with the bad. So let's start with the bad. Um, let's, um, and let's look at the recipients. The recipients, especially for those of us who are in the global South, we have, we've always, we've traditionally gone through, the, we've gone through the traditional non-government organizations, whether they were church-based or uh, donor-based, from former colonial uh, 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 masters. And it comes with caveats and, it, and caveats that are not comfortable and they are they're without consideration of, of the community because we are here to help you with that mentality. We are here to help you, you're not doing well and we're here to help you. And because of that, people have become very conscious about what not, not-for-profit organizations can do to support those who do not have the power. And because of that arose the good, because people are questioning why can't we do this on our own? And why can't we involve, uh, you need to involve us if you want to work with us, because it's not an assumption that you're coming to just, you're, not, you're just coming to help us, but you need to work with us so that we can solve this problem. So how are we doing away with the, what, has, what is the good that has arisen out of this? We're seeing more, not for profit organizations becoming inclusive. Now let's look at it from the open science uh, space. Now, when you're looking at inclusivity, we are looking at uh, organizations working with various stakeholders, not coming and saying, we are not, not in a situation where traditionally the global North was, would come and say, oh yeah, you need this data because you know what, it is free and you don't have access to it. Instead, we are having organizations working with partners in the global South to find out, okay, how can we work with you? What problems are you facing? So the narrative has, to, has slowly started changing, okay? And, and it, the, the, and the reason why it changed is because the recipients complained and they said enough is enough, okay? B- because it wasn't seen as bad by those who are providing it, we are helping you. But then the recipients were like, no, you're not helping us. It's, you're giving us a data dump or you're just giving us information that is not relevant. So it's because we have said enough is enough, then, the good side has a reason. And because of that, it's a bit more inclusive. So we find uh, not-for-profit uh, global partners or not-for-profit partners who are based in the global north coming down to the global south to work with those in the global south to understand what are your needs? How can we work together? And I believe I've seen Omo here. Uh, there he is, he's around. And Omo is one of the major stakeholders in the Global South uh, through Lipsense. So coming down from the Global North to reach out to Lipsense, what are your needs as Lipsense? Okay, how can we work together? Yes, how can we work together to support your community? 
coming down to to work with TCC Africa, I see you work with with with, with early career researchers and you work with government. How can we work together? So the narrative is slowly changing, and I've literally seen this change in ten years. In the last ten years, we never saw we never saw this. Uh, the 20 and the 2000s, it was, we are dumping information. So it was we who said enough is enough. What you're giving us is not relevant. You do not understand our needs. You need to include us more. Even some of the declarations you're making, you're not including what our contributions are. So the good has a reason as a result of those who've been receiving the information or the support saying, no, what you're giving us is not relevant. And don't get me wrong. This is a generational thing. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a generational thing. It's the younger ones who are saying, no, enough is enough. The older ones were just happy to receive it because they'd gone through a lot of challenges as it were, and they were happy to, to get help. But it's the younger ones who, who are a bit more discerning to say, yes, thank you for the help, but that's not good enough. This is These are our needs. Why don't we work together? Together to support our respective communities. So the good has a reason from the historical bit of the bad that we were receiving. Thank you, Joy. Um, and I think that in trying to discourage the good and encourage the bad, I mean, it's, and this is going to sound like I've got, you know, three, like, a, this is going to sound like it's off a brochure, but it's really not. It's just the most straightforward way to say it. Um, I think that there are, are three things, some of which um, you know, Joy and Pia both touched on. Um, I think you need capacity, transparency, and good governance. Um, this, those, those will do both of those things. Um, so capacity, you know, organizations, and people, even outside of formal organizations, because I know some of our discussion is including organizations that, for whatever reason, have opted to not yet formalize. Um, that that they need to be able to have the capacity to do things what we would consider to be the right way. Um, trying to accomplish an objective um, can, if you feel strongly enough in the objective, can cause you to take shortcuts, can cause you to tell yourself that the ends justify the means. Um, you know, that, that as long as I accomplish X, um, Y will forgive me for doing, you know, whatever it is that I just did. And I think that the, the, the way through some of these is providing capacity through money, through trading, through you know, whatever, to, to help the um, correct path um, be more easily attainable. Um, and it, it, it sounds like, you know, this is very um, esoteric, but it's, it's really not. It, even if it's just, you know, if you've ever tried balancing your own checkbook, it's much easier um, to, uh, to just, you know, pay for your groceries and then never think about it, you know, again. But, but it really is better if you keep a running list of all of the things that you spend, because then you know whether or not you've spent too much money. Um, it's documentation. And it's, but it's on an organizational level. It's the, it's the same, it's something that's so easy to not do, but you really do need to do it. And so uh, giving organizations the breathing room, the, the capacity building, the infrastructure grants um, helps them do things the right way so that they don't do it the quick way and then have something to come back and fix later. Um, the second transparency, and I know that Pia talked about this a little bit, she preferred clarity. Um, I think that I think I still like transparency a little bit better because there are plenty of clear, concise, um, easily understandable, and entirely wrong messages out there. Um, for example, I give you Twitter, um, which is just a hive of activity this week. Um, so just just because it's um, just because it's clear doesn't mean it's it's good, right, truthful. Um, but uh, but I do, I do think that transparency is, is a step in the right direction um, because it doesn't rely on you to exercise your own norms of right or wrong. It is, it is providing a window into what it is that is actually happening. So I think that the ability to essentially have you know, an open ledger 
um, through through places like Open Collective is is interesting. And over time, which I do think is an important ingredient, will build some of that legitimacy. Um, but I think that being clear not only about your finances, but about what it is that you're doing, about you know what it is that your goal is, how far you got down the path of achieving that goal, what lessons you learned on the way. Um, I think those are all extremely important. So it's not just being transparent about the operations um, of how your organization or movement works, but also being transparent about what it is that you are doing with those resources. And then there's good governance. And over, over the years, I've tried to use a bunch of different words here, and none of them really fit. So uh, I used to say empowerment, um, but... But empowering people without check isn't always the best option. Um, so, so I don't think empowerment is quite, quite the right fit. Um, inclusivity, I think, is also good. But you can include people on your board and just not listen to them. So there needs to be more than just including people. There needs to be actual devolution of, of, of power um, to, to individuals in order to make that work. So it's that, and it's not even so much power sharing, um, though I know that right now there are more and more boards in, in the US and Canada that, for example, are setting aside a certain number of their seats on their governing board for individuals that are receiving their services. So if you are running an organization that uh, you know, provides uh, rehabilitation um, housing for individuals that are trying to break free of, of you know, poverty or, or drugs, then, then having individuals that are either currently receiving services or have received services in the past, guaranteeing that those people make up a third of your governing board ensures that the lived experience of what it is like to actually receive those services are going to be reflected in your programming. Um, and so, so it's really, that's what I say, that's what I mean when I say good governance. It's not about, giving people power and walking away. It's not about including certain people in the room and not listening to them. It really is about who has control over the programming, who has a say, who has a vote, who's influential. Um, and that one, I think, even though I can't think of a snappy word for it beyond good governance, I think is probably the most critical ingredient, especially when thinking about innovative um, ideas such as open data, because that, that XM project that I referred to earlier, where, where we were a, a team, uh, a group of uh, over 100 researchers, where we all kind of mapped out the, the social enterprise forms in our own country and then poured it back into a central collective. And um, we, were, we were all academics. And so it was all, you know, there's there no profit motivation. It was all about providing things so that we finally knew how many social enterprise forms there were. Um, and, and there was quite a bit of, I don't want to say fighting, um, discussion, disagreement over um, who would have access to the, the final data set, because we were all very interested in our own countries, but we knew our own countries. That's why we were part of the collective in the first place. What everyone wanted was access to the giant data set. Um, but you know, when over 100 people got access to the giant data set, then it would be a race to see who could publish first. And so even, even the academics with their knowledge, it ended up coming down to scrapping over who had governance over, over the knowledge resource. Um, and so I think that that's something that is key to remember is that even though we're, we're talking about open data and we're talking about knowledge, um, it should be apparent this week uh, that, that we will find a way to fight um, over, over even intellectual property and knowledge. Um, so, so having the right governance construct going in, um, in addition to transparency um, and, uh, um, and uh, capacity, I think is, is essential, even from the start. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And just kind of building off of that, I'm, I'm really curious, um, you know, Elizabeth, in your experiences, you know, the um, behavioralist economist and, and Joy, from your experience kind of doing this work, what do you feel are those, I'll use the word deficiency, you know, 
what's keeping us from being our best selves in this case? You know, is it just the incentive structure? Uh, you know, without going to a full tour of the human psyche and all the like nuances of it, but like, what are the main things that stand out for why we aren't our best selves when we do this work? Is it just incentives? Is it, are there other things kind of going on, things that we should be aware of as we are we're starting to parse and discern, you know, the, the better from the not so well and who in, in this work? To a certain degree is, to a certain degree, it's an issue of incentives. And when I say incentives, it's not necessarily the money aspect. It's, um, it's what are we getting out of working together? You know, in, in this case, um, we are, we, are, we, are, we are looking at why aren't we able to, to be our best in, uh, in the delivery of service. So we are trying to come away from the, the bad and get into the good, but we're still struggling at the end of it. Um, this is the incentive bit. So when you're like, if what are we getting out of working together? What, what are we getting out of this? Are we going to get recognition? Are we going to get, are we going to get, uh, what kind of results are we going to get out of it? And sometimes when potential partners or whether it's the not-for-profit organization is working with the, with the targeted community and not seeing eye to eye, you end up getting uh, negative results out of it. And you still find yourself, you, you still find yourself uh, um, mark timing on the situation you're on. And in such situations, especially if the not-for-profit organization had not even engaged the community, it's either a failure where they just give up and say they did not work and it, it's left as a white elephant, or there's a level of force of enforcing in, uh, uh, some of this support on them that you need it. So creating an, a, a need that maybe these this, this recipients do not have. So I'll give a few examples that are not necessarily in the open, uh, open science uh, sector that you could to just give context um, to my example. So in Kenya, we have um, a classic example. We went through farming and I, I get this when we're doing our prep. We went through farming and uh, an epic failure was when some of the not-for-profit organizations from the US sent in yellow corn to Kenya. And this is an area that is going through farming and they took it back because you're forcing, you know already you've tried several times to send different kinds of, uh, of, 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 of donations to them, but you're not making the effort to understand what it is that they need. So they took it back. And the issue is the incentive here in this case was, did you take a step back to understand what they needed other than just immediate solution food, okay? That is that was that is Kenya in terms of food. Now let's go to open science. Um, when uh, open science started, and also when we when we are all getting into the open access movement, um, Africa has been a recipient sometimes of data dumps because you know you create the need, you need the data because it's open. Okay, so this is where you're looking at still the level of the bad. You need the data without taking into consideration whether that data is even relevant to the continent or whether that data has information about the continent. So the first few years, we were receiving quite a bit of data and a small percentage of that data was, did not even, was not even from the continent. Okay, so it reached a point where partners in the global south say, no, 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 no. We want data that is relevant to us if you're to even share that information with us. So that's what I'm talking about, incentives. If you're giving, inform when you're, if, if you're looking at working with your community and you, you still find yourself teetering on the bad side, the reason why you're still stuck there is that the incentive that you feel that you're giving to the community is not helping. It's, it's not an incentive, it's just a giveaway because you're, you're trying to placate your heart because you're helping. And this is something that we see as 
a big challenge with most not-for-profit organizations when they're helping organizations or regions that uh, are not, that do not have a capacity. So like, they'll just assume you need it without trying to make an effort to understand what do they need? What, what, are, what, what do they have to begin with and what can we build on? Okay, so the incentive, as I said, is not, I wasn't looking at it from a monetary perspective. It is looking at what we have and how can you help with what we have? Or do you understand what we need so that we can work together to build on that? So, um, and that can be a bit of a bitter pill to swallow because traditionally uh, not-for-profit organizations have heavily relied on uh, as I say, the dependency theory, we are constantly giving you, and it is locked to either corporate or locked to, to the government uh, or, a, or a particular government. So it's, 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 it's a, it's a well-oiled machine where they're just constantly giving you, giving you uh, whatever kind of support and with the expectation that you will receive and accept it. So the incentive in this case is making an effort in understanding your community before you give out whatever information or support that you intend to provide. Yeah, that is why you still see them teetering. And it's, yeah, that shift is a bit of a challenge. You know, that, that shift is really a bit of a challenge because you're making people think differently. But in this case, the incentive for us is to be sustainable, not just to continuously give us, but how can we work together to build ourselves so that we can be sustainable? Dependency theory makes us heavily reliant on you, no matter what other options, what no matter uh, no matter what other way you decide to give us, whether it's information, it's data, or physical support. Yeah. I think that there there are a lot of good words in in what you asked. Richard, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and um, focus on, on on just a couple. Um, so first, I'd like to echo what what Joy said. Um, it is about incentives, and that doesn't have to be money. It can be about you know having access to the knowledge. It can be having access to the research, new markets. You you name it. Um, prestige, uh, publication. It's the the, the possibilities are endless. Um, but but if that is what is motivating people that that will lead people to good and will lead people astray. Um, so if, if we're thinking about putting together what I would consider to be uh, not necessarily public goods, but, but either a public good or a common good um, or a club good, anything where there is a, a, an element of community ownership, there, there needs to be an understanding that not everyone is going to think the community is prime, you know, the, the, in, the, in the first important spot at all times. In those instances, are you going to have governance structures that encourage people to think about community? Um, and I think that's where, that's why a lot of organizations decide to formalize is because that's either a reaction to something having gone wrong, um, such as, you know, Joy was describing, that's, that's how they got this brand new policy package um, of, of the, the NGO charter is because wrong things were happening. Um, or, and especially in, in the US, which is a kind of litigious society, we enjoy suing each other. Um, a lot of very small organizations will formalize for the liability protection um, in case they get sued. So, uh, so there is, there is an element of a um, both both following the incentives and having kind of a, a defensive mindset. I think to make sure that everyone is not the participants are not exposed to badness by by being a part of the collective. Um, but I also think that, that I think there are two additional things that need unpacking. Um, the first is that you know you ask why we're not our best selves, um, and and you know the other that's I. I think that if we wait to be our best selves, um, we're never going to get anything done. Um, because, and I joke about this sometimes, that that my job is actually taking the effects of people being truly terrible to each other and going to many of those same people for resources to fix the problems that they cause. 
Now, this has been overlaid several times, you know, about whether or not this is about humanity or whether this is about capitalism or whether it, you know, so, so, so pile on the additional ideology that, that you would like to that example. But, but I do think that we shouldn't be waiting for our ideal selves to show up. Um, we, in fact, need to move forward on the, on the problems that we have now. Um, and so, so don't, don't wait for your ideal self. Um, and, and finally, that, that you had, there was, there was a hint of equating um, of efficiency with, with our best selves. And, and part of me thinks that you actually tempted me on that one, Richard, because you know that, that I am, uh, um, I've, I've gone on record on saying that I think that the pursuit of efficiency um, has actually done great harm to uh, the nonprofit sector. Um, we continue to starve ourselves down capacity-wise, trying to make it look like we have absolutely no overhead at all, um, uh, that, that we're, we, we've done irreparable damage to our, to our organizations um, because we are so focused on not having any overhead um, that we now don't have the capacity to actually grow or, or, or be functioning organizations into the future. I think we've managed to, by, by chasing efficiency, made ourselves very short-term and very ineffective um, in the long-term. Um, so, so I do want to caution against that. We're, we're all data believers here, um, but not to confuse effectiveness with efficiency. Um, and that means, especially in capacity building organizations such as IOI, where we are empowering the organizations that are then empowering other people, that when you start thinking about how to measure your own effectiveness, that you don't stop at the organizations that you're empowering, that you need to actually move beyond into how, uh, how is the needle being moved for the individuals that are receiving funding from the organizations that you funded? Because IOI creating a bunch of healthy organizations, I mean, that's fabulous. But what you really want is to see empowered African scholars. You want to see empowered individuals around the globe. And so knowing whether or not the, those, you know, that, that there's impact happening there, that's, I would, I would encourage you to move into that space as well. Don't, don't settle for, capacity is great but don't settle for efficiency measures at organizations to judge whether or not IOI is actually making a difference. Thanks, Dad, I really appreciate it. And Leslie, I am so sorry, um, but I wanna give you the opportunity to ask your question. Um, it's probably gonna be more than the few minutes that we have to answer it, but I hope, um, please ask your question, Elizabeth, um, you do your best to answer it, please. Yeah, so, thank you, Joy and Elizabeth for these very, uh, thought provoking and uh, really helpful reminders. Uh, I was really excited earlier on Elizabeth when you mentioned social economy, uh, because this is precisely what we're talking about that the language of social economy is very different from that of the market economy, which is about mm -hmm. return on investment efficiencies and, and, and profits, where, where in social economy, we're looking for different things. We're measuring different things. We, we're looking for different kind of impacts. And, and so we always tend to forget and get sucked into this other language of the market. And I'm always you know, dumbfounded when libraries sign deals with you know, publisher and say, oh, we're saving money or we're having a discount, therefore we're ahead. And, and not forgetting that shouldn't be using those kind of terms because within this institution, we're trying to look for different things. I remember some years ago reading this book by Lori Mook, which is at my university. Uh, this book has been very it's influential awesome. on social accounting. And I'm hoping that we could draw from these frameworks that have to change our language and in, in what really counts, you know, in terms of investments and returns and so forth. So maybe you could, mm. you could bring us along in that direction. Well, I do, and I think uh, Lori, Lori is fabulous. Uh, the social accounting book is fabulous. So for those on the call that have not read that, I strongly encourage it. Um, I think that, that on some level, I find great encouragement in the fact that much of what we are doing is in fact not new. We call it social enterprise or social economy. 
um, and uh, and people get really excited about the terms and new thing, innovative. But, but there's actually been quite a bit of people funding organizations that don't totally destroy their community. And this has happened throughout time. We did not come up with the idea of running a responsible business. It's just we've drifted from that being the norm. So mm -hmm. there's, I, I, and I think that this is most stark when you start thinking about what we call social entrepreneurs. Um, and this is, this is a, a message that I've, I've often said uh, in, in the US where if, you know, if, a, if a, a person with white skin at Yale wants to uh, you know, create a company that sells solar ovens in, you know, in, in, in Kenya, then he's a social entrepreneur. But if it's a Kenyan that wants to form a company in, you know, that sells solar ovens in Kenya, well, he's a needs-based entrepreneur. And we just don't think that's quite as interesting as the social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a colonial um, yeah. approach. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that, and one of the things I love most about Lori's book is that it brings in the, um, it takes the finance and it, 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 it talks about how it actually is attached to these social concepts that it's not new that we're trying to do this, mm -hmm. that we've done this for a long time and we need to remember how we did this. Um, and so, so I think that we should find encouragement in the fact that it's, that this has been done before um, and that we need to remember that it's the normal way to run any type of organizational form, mm -hmm. whether it's a for-profit, a nonprofit, a cooperative, whatever, all of those can be run in a healthy community in a way mm -hmm. that gives back. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that the closer we come to that, I think the better. Um, certain tax exempt forms will have different incentives, um, but all organizational types have the potential to be good citizens. Um, and I think that the more we normalize that, the better off we'll be. Really, because I know Joy wants to respond, but we are about at time. And so I've been oh, a horrible cool. facilitator of this panel. And I just want to open it up. We have a few closing things. If you can stick around, please do so. Um, Joy, I would love your thoughts on this and can you can close us out. I have a quick closing thought and I'm gonna turn you back over to Carl and Sara. So Joy, please close us out with your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an issue of not trying to remember. We choose to forget because uh, we are quick to make as much money as possible. Then we'll come up with fancy foundations and say it's for social good. But in essence, originally business was for public good. So we choose to forget and uh, what I what I say is that uh, why, what I say is that let's re just reiterating what you're saying. Let's remember why we started business in the first place. This is to support the communities around us, and whether it's going to be in the not for profit uh, arena or whether it's going to be in a for profit arena, it is to support the communities around us. And we need to be conscious of that. And we need to be inclusive in the kind of engagements we are making so that it's not biased from an economic, uh, from an empowerment perspective. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the panelists. Um, and thank you all of you, for the questions and everything you've offered. I just really quickly, um, besides immense gratitude, Elizabeth, Joy, thank you so much. Um, but I also want to just point out, these are the individuals that we are engaging. These are the thoughts that we are having. Um, this is where we're headed. And we really appreciate you all being on the journey with us. So thank you to both Elizabeth and Joy and, and all of you on our committees. So thank you so much. And I'll turn this back over to Sara and Carla and, and let's let them close us out. Perfect. So first of all,